Welcome to Shh, the Secret Podcast. And now your hosts, JM and Bernstein. And this is loose anyway, so. <clears throat> she said. <laughs> I'm right about to do the intro and get. <laughs> All right. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the final installment of the Secret Podcast for 2018. It has been an interesting year, uh, full of almosts and ahas. And on this episode, the final one of the year, we're going to have a number of our prior guests from this year's shows to talk about the goings-on of this year. And with us, joining us, as you will, is, of course, my co-host, George, down in St. Augustine. Also coming to us from Florida is Brian Zinn, Matt Sparks out in California, Brad, one of our newest members who George will tell you about, and Brett maybe in and out. And we're also waiting on Andy Abrams to join us at some point in the near future. Oh, as well, we have from Ohio Kit Palancar joining us as well on the show for the final one of the year. And sort of an afterthought. He's cheap. <laughs> <laughs> so Merry Christmas to everybody. I hope everyone's having a good uh, holiday season and the weather's not bringing anyone down. I know George doesn't like to talk about the weather, but we have to wait till Andy gets here. So what else are we going to do? It's cold here. It's like 70 degrees. It sucks. We're having to break out sweaters. <laughs> Matt, is ever did you avoid the fires? Um, avoid the fires, not the smoke. The smoke. I worked like hundred miles, now nah, fifty miles from where the fires were, and my work was shut down for two weeks. Two weeks because of the smoke. Yeah, the, like the smoke limit is like one hundred and eighty parts per million of whatever they're measuring, and it was like two seventy to three forty in there bunch of days so you can you can say you had an extended smoke break ah. i did that's good yeah yeah that's what it actually felt like is you're you're smoking a pack a day <laughs> and wasn't there another storm that came through down by you brian no i don't think so it was 74 degrees today it's our cold front it, yeah it was a cold front oh, it was a cold front. <laughs> it was actually in the 50s at one point <laughs> What did you guys do? 50s for real? Rachel brought the cactus inside. You can't even go swimming. <laughs> you can't go swimming or nothing. It's terrible. <laughs> oh. It's been an interesting year as far as the secret goes. At least pretty much started out with a bang. Um, well, actually, before we get going, is there anything new news that we should talk about right now? Is there any new hot things that popped up in the last uh, couple weeks that need to be mentioned oh yeah uh, my dad told me everything where the gps coordinates are for every treasure uh, and i've compiled it in a pdf and i put it online nice <laughs> no important stuff we want oh sh okay <laughs> <laughs> all right anyway prior to this year starting there was some blow up in houston where the local news had covered the treasure hunt on a couple of their I think it was during one week they had a segment in their morning news and then a bigger segment in their evening news, and that kind of blew up. But at the beginning of this year is when the Expedition Unknown episode aired, and it was sometime in mid-January, like around the 16th or something. I mean, look, John, that's not when this blew up this year. This year in January, we released the podcast. And then thousands of people joined the Facebook yeah, group. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, it was just coincidence that that thing aired. It was pushed back anyway, so really. Josh Gates filmed an episode because we made a podcast. But we knew, Brian, we knew that was coming out for a while, right? That was filmed well before it aired, right? Oh, yeah, Andy and I were dying. We had filmed that in April of 2017. And uh, they told us it would come out in the fall of 2017. And they just kept pushing it back further and further until finally it came out in January. Did you get anything cool from that? Like, I know uh, one of the guys from Chicago got like an autographed blank DVD with the episode. Did you get anything cool from, from the episode? No, I got a rental reimbursement. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> and that took a while, too. 
<laughs> the travel channel doesn't move very quickly. <laughs> no, it was a lot of fun spending time with Josh Gates. I enjoyed that a lot. So what was it like off camera? Like, was he actually a fun guy to hang out with and talk to? Or? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like a guy you'd sit down and have a beer with. Just, uh, he was very enthusiastic. Same guy off camera as on camera. Uh, it was a lot of fun. One thing they didn't really show in the episode is that the last hour or two, it poured. It was just raining like crazy, but we were still digging. And at one point we had to wait for the rain to stop. So we took cover and we got to talk to him for like an hour while the rain was coming down. Does it rain everywhere that guy goes? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we give Josh Gates some shit, but he's done some cool stuff. Like, I mean, he slept in, uh, was it King Tut's tomb? That was pretty cool. Yeah, um, that's true. So he, he seems like a good dude. So he even said this was uh, the most fun he's ever had in any of his episodes. I can't believe that. He slept in King Tut's tomb. Like, like <laughs> the secret's awesome and all, but sleeping in King Tut's tomb, just like a camp out with a mummy. Right, that's right. Cool. <laughs> hey Kit, did the uh, Expedition Unknown people talk to you, or were you there when they were over talking to your dad? No, I totally miss Josh and all that. I think I remember coming home from my studio that was in Kent. There was like a film crew there, or like five or six people there with all their cameras and stuff, and that that's who I met. And then I, you know, they filmed me for some reenactment footage and some like close up painting shots, and that was it. Oh, so that was you in the recreation? Then. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> You can see like my chin and like a little bit of it, and then uh, there's like a blur. So thing. wait a minute, what did you do? Take a printed out picture and then just paint water on it, or how did? What were you doing? My, I think my dad photocopied the painting or took a picture of it and printed it. Well, he had to edit. He told me like very loosely he had to edit out some stuff in Photoshop, and then he printed it out and mounted it to a board so it looked like. And I just mixed up some color that was like the original color and then painted that on top of like exactly. a sealed board. What you picture are we talking about? Oh, the St. Augustine one? The you, have no, you have no idea how interested I am in seeing what he had to Photoshop out. You like how we just slough that off? We just kind of pass that off. <laughs> and we, Yeah, and he had to Photoshop some stuff. And then so I got this paint that was really close to the other paint. <laughs> and I started painting up. Whoa, back up. You know how you said that he might send me something back for his Christmas present? I, I, I have an idea of what I would like that to be. <laughs> <laughs> what in the hell did he Photoshop out of that painting? <laughs> I have no clue. I, I really don't know. I, I don't even know where the original is, honestly. That may, um, you know how big the original was? Because that picture in the TV show was like tiny. It's like, like a piece of notebook paper. It was obviously a printout. Yeah. Andy. Yay! 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 Okay. Oh, Andy. Yeah. Yes. Andy, let, let me ask you. Weren't we doing it tonight because you said you were available? Yes. Okay. Well, I had, well, you weren't, were you? No, I had a, look, he's cross-examining me. I had a doctor's appointment. What do you want me to do? I just turned 52 years old. I, I have things I need to get checked. I told you, it's New York time. And then I start getting these texts, go on Facebook, and uh, I'm very not uh, social media savvy. Sorry. It's okay. It's all right. We were just discussing how Expedition Unknown aired. You became an instant celebrity with all of the judges in uh, the greater New York and New Jersey area. You're still a celebrity. You have no idea like how many messages I get asking me to get messages to you. And it's not Brian. It's not like, hey, Brian found the cast. Can you get him this thing? It's no. Can you connect me with Andy? Yeah, well, I kind of <laughs> feel like it evens out over time since every article that comes out mentions how Brian's in, found the cast in Cleveland. Yeah. And and every now and then I'll appear in a picture. My name doesn't <laughs> exactly come up, but I love George. When, when you send over a text or on the on the site to say so and so has a question for you. I just laugh out loud that there's someone actually trying to reach me to get my opinion on something. I love it. I think it's hysterical. When you guys were filming Expedition Unknown, we were talking about Josh Gates off camera. Do you have any stories about Josh Gates off camera? Yeah, he was surprisingly enthusiastic like a little kid i said to brian because after we did uh, the shoot in florida remember it was backwards so we shot florida then we shot cleveland the show showed it as cleveland and then we went to florida i got to fly to florida with those guys excuse me i got to fly to cleveland with those guys and on the plane he chatted it up he was so interested and i i didn't get the sense you know it was lights camera action and he was on he was totally 
into this. Now, I think part of it was because given the idea that most times he's searching for Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster with very little chance of actually finding it, um, this one was doable. Like I think that's what drives us all so crazy is it's doable. You guys are so smart. You have everything figured out. It's so close. <laughs> and yet it, it, it's, it's so far. So we spent the day in Cleveland and we shot 12, 13 hours. <laughs> we went to a coffee shop actually before we started and a woman walked in and started speaking in tongues. I mean, she was, and we were um, scared. We didn't know what was going on. I started thinking, is this a sign? Is, is, are they trying to tell us something? Stay away from Cleveland. And then she <laughs> collapsed and had to call EMT and we realized it was this horrible seizure or something happened. So I said, okay, we grabbed our coffee and left, made our way to the park and all day long, uh, off camera. He was asking me questions. He uh, what? went back to the hotel that night. He was sad that we that, that, that it had to end when I left. Uh, and, and this is kind of funny. Uh, he was going to see Palancar. I guess his kid on this call. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Andy, kid, kid, Andy. Oh, okay. It is so nice to meet you, kid. Huge, nice fan to meet of your, you huge fan of your dad. And you guys are doing a great thing with this expanded treasure hunt that you're working on. But you. so when he was at your dad's place, he was really jazzed up. So I'm driving around New Jersey and I get a text from Josh Gates. And uh, I said, what's up? And he said, I, I want to ask him a question. I don't know what to ask him. You got to give, give me something. There must be a, a way to, I kept saying, well, I'll ask him about this or ask him about that. I said, just listen to what he says and keep talking so i have this whole string of texts that me that he sent me he, he thought your dad was so nice i think he uh was hoping to in his interview style kind of not get him to reveal where things were but get something that was juicy a morsel of some uh something he could take with him uh, because at the end of the show uh, when he said and maybe says this you know like maybe says this to all the girls or maybe says this to all the the shows this was my favorite one ever I really felt like he wanted this. I really felt it was genuine. Brian, when we were in Florida and we thought we had it, you remember the reaction? Oh, I mean, yeah, that, sure. what, that, that was yeah. genuine. That was when a genuine they, reaction. What they showed on TV transpired over 30 seconds. They cut to a commercial and then cut to we're back, right? But when we were there, we dug around it. There were gas lines. I mean, George, you know this. How many times have you dug the family youth? Gas lines, electric lines, we cleaned at the spot, you know, we saw the shiny surface, which appeared to be plexiglass, and it was dark beneath. And it took minutes that seemed like hours. So it was over about 10, 15 minutes, and the anticipation was building up. And when we finally, you know, dug it loose, and it was a piece of black tile, oh my God, it was the classic high to a low, zero to 60 in no time flat. So I think there was a He's got a little bit of little kid in him, which I think is necessary for participating in this thing. Uh, and I think he wanted to find it, not just for the show. I think he actually wanted to find it. Hey, Kit, what did your dad say that Josh interviewed him for? Was it like six hours or eight hours or something un unruly like that? It was a really long time, right? Yeah, I think it was something like that. And my, I'm sure it just wasn't all Josh. Um not a bad thing, but my dad just, he loves to talk and he loves to share what he knows. And he knows a lot of stuff. Um, he talks <laughs> my ear off sometimes about simple things like the lawn or getting the mail. You know, this is like how you get the mail. You or the, S the SR-71 down. Blackbird for no reason at all. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think he had a pretty long conversation, but I think that's exactly what it was it wasn't so much josh interviewing him it was like a it was a discussion it was a conversation you know maybe about the history or just uh, about each other you know maybe it doesn't he wasn't even stuff about the the secret a whole lot i wish i was there to rip him a joke or something but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be great to get somebody like that on a podcast i wish we had access to a person like that and to a <laughs> only if <laughs> So anyway, that happened. Everybody was uh, interviewed and filmed, and there was a big episode. And we all sat around the TV with our popcorn waiting for the episode to air, and we all watched it. And the first thing that everybody said was, wait a minute, that's not a blob. And then some of these paintings were obviously cropped. So that was big news for a little while. I think the Montreal painting 
showing the fleur de lis on there was the biggest news for a while. But I think the image of the knight revealed to be bigger a little bit before that, Brian? Yes. What happened was, is when James Renner was filming his documentary, he took a couple of pictures in the studio of John Palancar. He sent me a couple. I happened to look at it and I see the Roanoke painting was there in the background and it looked to me like it was wider than in the book. So I asked if he had possibly had a more close up picture of it and he did. And I think I sent that to you, John. And I said, guess what? The, the uh, picture is cropped. And I think that's the first time that we saw that an original painting was different from the book. Also, there was more to some of them. Obviously, when Expedition Unknown aired, we found out that some things were covered up later. That was big news for a minute, and it sparked all kinds of interesting changes in uh, a lot of people's thinking, especially the people working on Montreal. It's too bad John's not here to share some of his thoughts on that. I, we touched on it briefly on the last podcast, but I know it was a big revelation for him. Did anybody else see any interesting things that happened in that episode? Did, did I pretty much cover them all? Other than, I just can't get that memory of James and Josh skipping up the stairs, singing the Laverne and Shirley song out of my head. It's like... Let's take a moment of silence in honor of Penny Marshall. It's so funny you brought that up. Oh, right. Yeah. Right? yeah. That's a little timely. Penny Marshall died? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm too young to get these references, so... <laughs> I'll just I'll be over here, all right. <laughs> they did it in Wayne's World. Remember they did it in Wayne's World. So. Oh yeah, with the um uh, Shots Meyer Brewery. And... Shots Brewery. Kids like I was I was right. four when that came out, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I have so much gray hair. I remember when, also when he was at your dad's place, kid, he said, he was looking around in the studio, I think he said to me, text me, he thought he saw a map of New York, like a small section of something. And he was- I told you guys that was a map of New York on the wall. He, he was freaked out. Oh my God. And he didn't ask any questions about it. He didn't take any pictures of it. And he, he didn't pry, but he was, I, I said to him, where, what part of New York? It's a big place, you know, like, and the funny part was I kept thinking if your dad is this mad genius, right? Like he said, he could have put up like a, a Susan B. Anthony stamp and left a certain coin or a certain picture and the mind process would have gone wild like oh what did that mean was that part of it i mean anything could have been in the studio i can answer that <laughs> he would do that too he would totally do that i can answer that question 100 percent, and say that that map has been hanging in his studio since we moved here oh my um, god it's so funny papers you know yellow <laughs> from cigarette smoke when he used to smoke and um so it's it's been there for quite a while when renner's documentary came out john was real big on that because you thought it had some sort of clue to new york or something and we went back and I thought it had a bunch of lines going in it. Yeah. From Wonder yeah, I saw a bunch of lines. I was like, wait a minute. And I remember when Expedition <laughs> Unknown came out and I saw that map and I was like, oh my God, it's not a clue at all. It's nothing. It's just something that <laughs> sits there on his wall. <laughs> right next to like the pictures of our old dog, you know, that we used to have. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but really, like on Facebook, everybody was tearing apart everything that was in that uh, that studio. I remember there was like a a mask or something. It looked like somebody had made a death mask, probably of JJP, that was hanging on the studio wall, and everybody was like, "Oh, that's the mask from New Orleans." Right? Nope. It was. No. They were tearing apart that studio. And once they found the one thing, then it was the mania was on. There was no stop. I can yeah. explain was, every single thing in his studio and why it's there and, and how it happened. I mean, not the secret paintings. I can't do that. Everything else, you know, I've I've been in his studio. A lot. I used to work in there and paint in there. So um, some of that stuff has been there for years. Like that that mask is. Um, I think he has like three or four of them made. They're um, concrete casts of friend that he. Um, Drew the book. It was in, the painting was in the Origins book, right? He drew, drew yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, Comet Rider or something. Yeah, yeah. Billy, Billy is his name. Yeah. That's his face. But don't you think? Don't you think that for most people who are watching, whether I'm not talking about newbies who were just going to introduced to the concept, but for the people who are really into the treasure hunt, getting to see that five minute clip inside the actor's studio so to speak right oh, it was like it was like getting a look inside the Batcave, cave oh, and awesome. anything you could see anything you could glean yeah. 
the way a pencil was pointing was, you know, like, so of course it's open to interpretation and everybody went crazy, but that's not anything that anyone would have ever seen other than Kit or, or John, right? Um, what a treat that was. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was amazing. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times I had my nose pressed to my uh, TV screen just staring at paintings in those shots, <laughs> going frame <laughs> by frame by frame. And as you guys know, I focus mainly on the Roanoke puzzle, and I can't tell you how infuriating it is that that jar with the paintbrushes are right there <laughs> covering the bottom right corner of this painting. <laughs> Having said that, and the thing about the St. Augustine painting before, there's a few of these paintings that we've just never seen, and people have always been like, oh, they're lost. Now I'm second-guessing why we've never seen them. That those brushes precariously covering part of Roanoke. Now, yeah, there's something going on. Well, maybe. Speaking of James and his movie, uh, he did finish it this year, and we didn't get anything but a trailer until October when it debuted at the film festival there. Kit and I went to go see it along with some older ladies and gentlemen. But it was cool. It was an interesting look. It wasn't, it wasn't extremely long. There were some funny moments, uh, you know. So, And still, I don't think a lot of people have seen it yet. Um, it's it's not really available. I just didn't have it in me. I didn't have the heart to steal the DVD. Uh, it was because it just had a projector in the back of the room, and I thought, well, I could just go up there and say, well, yeah, I want you know, I just wanted to grab this copy before. I <laughs> yeah, he told me to grab this DVD on the way out. So, I, yeah, James wanted me to grab this DVD. I just did. I couldn't do well, it. There's four people currently on the podcast that were in the movie. Maybe one of them can ask for a screener. Right. Kit was in the movie. You were wearing the wife beater. It was fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know what the hell was going on, but uh, he made me um, seem like I was like a crazed hunter or something. Like, I don't even know where they are. I, I've, I've been looking for these all day, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like Kit had a suit on when he started the interview, and James is like, no, lose the jacket. <laughs> Now, 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 lose what the show. call is this, James? What, what Take off your pants. pants. Take, Take off, off your pants. What movie was he making? <laughs> right. <laughs> and then things just kind of started to get crazy right after, you know, February. We had, there were some, spring happened, of course. Everybody got excited about going to look. In May, the end of May, there was a big, was it the end of April or the end of May? It might have been the end of April. There was a big article about San Francisco and all these people had descended on San Francisco and there was a website put up where you could request permission to dig in the park. And there was even a podcast that happened. Matt, what was going on in San Francisco at the beginning of the year? It was like a little mini explosion for the secret. It was. You almost had to get in line. Well, you did. You basically got in line to dig. They were getting so many requests to dig. They had to schedule them out. I think they had one or two <laughs> rangers, park rangers, who had to be there to watch you. So it was scheduling in their time. You'd ask for a permit, and they'd say, great, three weeks from now, uh, maybe. Or, yeah, you can come out tomorrow. Okay, so you had a dig during this whole permitting uh, issue, didn't you? And was there a representative there? And how did that go down? Because we didn't really talk too much about that. Basically because my dig site was at Legion of Honor, not at Golden Gate Park. My permit was denied. Huh. And then the groundskeeper said, no, come on out. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, sure, whatever you say. And we went out there and, um, you know, it, the permitting thing is like you can dig a hole. It can't be bigger than, uh, I think, two and a half feet across. So you, you have to have an exact spot. I dug my spot. I found a rock. <laughs> and then the uh, groundskeeper was going, well, what about over here? Right. Yeah. I said, you want me to dig? I'll dig there. And he said, okay, no, but how about, how about over here at this corner? Let's dig there. And so uh, ended up... <laughs> digging probably four or five spots that one dig oh he was patient yeah he was really into it and now he's dug up everywhere else yeah right he he checked all the rest of the spots for you after you left could you imagine though if you were a ranger you know you sit down at the meeting the weekly meeting you have or whatever and they tell you about this new <laughs> this new position they have for a couple of these guys you have to go supervise the treasure hunt <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it became the least popular 
job really quickly. It gives me a good idea. I'm going to send my resume to John Frazier. Maybe I can supervise his hunts now. <laughs> George, the new hunt supervisor at the Fountain of Youth. Everybody at the Fountain of Youth is well-versed on hundreds of years of history, except George. He can tell you what's been going on since 1981. Certainly since the beginning of the year. There's been a lot of action in San Francisco, and there still seems to be. There's many people that I've talked to that have uh, dug unsuccessful holes in San Francisco this year. Matt has. I'm actually stunned. They're like, let me count here. Wait a second. There's people who are up by the cross. There's people who are at the Legion of Honor. There's multiple people in different places in Golden Gate Park. Then there's the people down by Girardelli Square and the Maritime Park. Then there's the people at, oh yeah, gosh, it's people at Sutro Tower. The old airfield. I can't remember the name of the airfield. And there's people in the Castro, and there's people in Los Angeles. The thing is, everybody is absolutely sure they are correct, and their solution is, you know, spot on. They don't even care about <laughs> listening to anybody <laughs> else's solution. It's amazing. There is one person that I talk to about San Francisco, no lie, that thinks the San Francisco cask, and he calls it the San Francisco cask, is in L.A. <laughs> All right. He starts in San Francisco. He ends in L.A. Well, there it is. Also, in New Orleans, a bunch of stuff blew up. There were uh, hidden treasure articles, and there were vectors and masons and uh, the number seven and wolves, George. Wolves. Lots of wolves. There's wolves everywhere. Kit, why does your dad love wolves so much? <laughs> so much so that he would paint 700 into one painting. Ooh, it's a lot of wolves. I don't know. I really don't Look, know. Maybe he we... is a lone wolf. That's what he had to Photoshop out of that image, George, was all the wolves. <laughs> Can we answer this one question right now? Kit, how good at math is your dad? Yeah, he's got an adding machine on his desk, so I... <laughs> I... So, super complicated vectors? Probably not? Probably not, no. Probably okay, not. Gotcha. What yeah. if he's just collecting adding machines? Does it have a tape? You know, does it have tape that comes out of it? It does have tape. It does. <laughs> but does he have an abacus? He do, uh, That's I, old school. We do have an abacus somewhere. It's That's in the it. basement. He's got an abacus. It's in St. Louis. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, there were a bunch of Wait, articles. Can I, can I ask Matt a question? Well, because I've never been to a dig site, and I've had my share going out, but I've never been out when there were a bunch of people around also looking. And Andy hasn't been to Cleveland dig site either. <laughs> well, yeah, right. I, I just, I wonder what, if, how do people behave? Like when they recognize each other, the, either they're carrying a copy of the book or are they courteous to each other? Is it like a, a comic con, like a secret con? Like are people excited to run into other treasure hunters or do they get very secretive about their solutions and kind of go their own way? I would think it would be kind of fun. I mean, I, crowded, but fun, no? I've often figured that people would be, you know, secretive, and it's not that way. It's when you have somebody who is even slightly interested in this treasure hunt, people just want to tell all their ideas and share all their ideas. So everything yeah. starts coming back. Yeah, I, I did a dig with, like... I think it was 10 people that ended up showing up in the Fountain of Youth, and literally that's what they did. They just stood around in a circle talking about the hunt. I think one person dug a hole. And people drove like six hours. To, it was just like a big meetup. They all came specifically to dig, but when they all realized they were there together, they just they shared each other's ideas. That's so was that the one where the guy was digging it yeah, over the, the, the uh, hole? He was digging over a fiber optic cable. And he said, don't dig here. There's a fiber optic cable. And he said, okay. And you guys walked away and came back and he was digging up. Dug it anyway. No, I just realized something. Andy, Andy, you've been to what? Like three of the city? You've been to San Francisco, Cleveland, and New York? St. Augustine, Cleveland, New York, and also Roanoke. We went down um, to, um, we were vacations right after we had done the Cleveland thing a couple years later. We were on vacation. We were right down by Kill Devil Hill and... I took my daughter and nephew out, and we went and scoured it. And I got to tell you, to this day, my daughter was probably nine at the time. She's now 18. She still talks about it 
as one of the most fun days of all time. Just passing different things that people had written about and discovering them on your own. I mean, it was so fantastic. Uh, and the difference between doing it with Brian and then doing it with my daughter, I mean, totally different experience, but the joy of doing it was uh, was amazing. So yeah, I've been lucky enough to visit four of the sites. Uh, I just broke my theory that you only visit dig sites when there's a reporter present. <laughs> I'm going to say I think the uh, openness of people willing to discuss uh, the secret uh, on site is uh, highly dependent upon the friendliness of that site. <laughs> uh, being in Roanoke, they're not openly hostile, as I've heard about Milwaukee, but they definitely don't want you digging there. Uh, so I've seen other people walking around with a book, but I obviously don't want to draw attention to myself. So I have, now that you guys have said uh, everybody's been really friendly, I kind of feel like the asshole, but I've never been the guy like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> I see you have the book. Let's talk about it because well, I, mean, I don't the, want to draw attention to myself. When George and I were, I was in St. Augustine for an extended period and George and I were walking around Fountain of Youth one evening and they're like, he's, he's spotting couples out that are walking around the Fountain of Youth also. And he's like, those people are diggers. I see them around. Those, pe those people listen to the podcast over there. <laughs> <laughs> I would think that if you guys were out there, right, and I was sort of a newer, I was just kind of into this, and I, I'm familiar with your names or your, your identities on social media, and if I got to walk up and they're like, wait, you're, you know, Walter Falcon, you're John Michael, like, to meet somebody, there is a, a almost a fame factor, recognition factor, where it's got to be exciting to some of these folks to run into someone who's as knowledgeable as you guys are, or to see Brian, like if, if I'm walking around and I see Brian in St. Augustine, I, and I'm on one of these hunts, I would ask for his autograph. I mean, I would be, you know, because it's exciting to see a founding father, to see people who really know what they're talking about. There must be some sort of celebrity If we knew status. what we were talking about, we would <laughs> yeah, right. have the cask. <laughs> that's that's happened once or twice in St. Augustine, but generally people just want to tell me why I'm wrong. Yes, uh, that's it. That's that's what it is. Uh, they they want to tell you about their idea and you know come oh, help them dig. And and I love it, man. And I'll I'll go help them dig. There was a dude that wanted to dig outside of uh of uh Howard Johnson this past weekend, and I went and helped them dig. Like I think he's wrong. Whatever. It was fun. I'll I'll totally talk. You tell me why I'm wrong. George will dig anywhere. He'll even dig outside of Gallier Hall in the middle of well at any time of day or night. It appears. Yeah. Yeah. He's never <laughs> dug my St. Augustine spot, so... Where was your St. Augustine spot? Straight in from the gate, down mm -hmm. past the parking lot, almost to the, the trees. station. I talked to Frazier. Remember I told you that he told me we could dig it, and then he put up a moratorium. I haven't been able to dig anything in the Fountain of Youth. In fact, this past weekend, the guy that we were out digging, um, we were out digging at, like, midnight, and all of a sudden, cops swarm the Fountain of Youth, and John Frazier pulls up literally at midnight, Says that the the night watchman caught some dude jumping over the fence. Like he's come on. No, no, it's, oh, it was not really. Yeah, literally, they're not going to let anybody dig there anymore. They're just not going to do it. It caused too much trouble. It's so disrespectful, and a couple bad apples ruin it for everybody. It's unfortunate. I mean, they had what? They had chains broken. They had rocks broken. I they the had TV plants show. pulled up. I do. Sorry, I do. Well, you know what though, and George, you know Frazier, he could not have been nicer, right, Brian? I mean, you've uh, obviously had a lot of interaction. I only met him that day that we did it. He was so nice and so into yeah. it. Also, I yeah. felt badly for him. And if people were more uh, respectful, it could have been a great thing for the park and yeah, for everything else. The thing about Frazier is. If Byron were to buried that in the park in the 70s or the 80s, John Frazier's dad would have had to have been involved. And that's how John Frazier sort of wrapped the secret into his world. He He's associated with a project that his dad did. So he wants to have it solved. He wants to be a part of something that his dad was a part of. And, uh -huh. and I think it kind of breaks his heart that this thing that he loves is being destroyed by all these other people. Well, certainly it's bound to happen. You can't control how people act. George and I were in New Orleans. George seems to have a penchant for digging up sewer pipes. But underneath the sewer pipe in New Orleans, he hit uh, some pieces that look like a cask. And he did that in Charleston, too. Why do you keep hitting sewer pipes and pieces of things that look like a cask in plexiglass as well, George? What's going on? So every city that I've dug except Roanoke, I've hit a sewer pipe. The only reason I haven't done it in, in Roanoke is because there's no bathroom for like eight 
a hundred miles from where, I mean, I think in New Orleans, we were right. I think we were right. And nobody's been able to prove anything different to me. Certainly remains to be seen. Um, in Roanoke, instead of sewer pipes, we get sign footers. Oh, yeah. We were able to find out where all of the, the signs were in the past because we found all their footers. Huh. In Roanoke, instead of taking the signs out of the ground, they just cut the metal post right underneath the ground and then bury the metal post. <laughs> we're poking around with a prod and we hit something super hard and, and about the right size and dig it up. And no, it's a sign footer. Well, at least you know where all the signs are at. What else has happened over the year? Also, Brian becomes a star in South Korea YouTube land. <laughs> Did everybody see this now? That was great. <laughs> it was the most amazing thing. Was it like a J-pop thing, George? What was I, it was some sort of weird Korean drama where they were reenacting the secret and they reenacted Brian and Andy's dig, right? I don't know. At the end, it, it just nuts. had the picture of Brian standing there at the wall with his arms open, but surrounded by a bunch of treasure. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> it was great. That's how I imagine Brian sleeping at night. Uh, just on a big pile of gold. <laughs> that's, oh, yeah. I, just, I mean, that's not what it really looked like. <laughs> it was so good and so cheesy and so fantastic because knowing Brian and seeing the portrayal on TV, knowing that, I mean, when he sent me, when he said, I remember who sent, I guess I saw it in one of the emails that went back and forth. I literally watched it three times in a row. I was cackling out loud. I couldn't take how funny that was. So did you get any residuals from that? Did you get like a, just a check? Oh, he's huge in South, in South Korea. <laughs> he's he's huge. Like gold. Brian's got his own K-pop <laughs> band. <laughs> <laughs> did we ever find out, was that made this year? Or is that something that Forrest found? It was made in 2017. Wow. It was made last year, or the year before last. Last year, I don't remember what year. <laughs> Speaking of online stuff, there was a lot of strange online interaction. I guess we can't talk about the year in review without talking about our buddy Josh. Oh, fun. Fun. Fun, Josh. So I don't... D does he need an introduction? I think everybody knows who Josh Cornell is if they've been following along. Uh, he was the original I Solved All 12 Treasures in 20 Minutes. Oh, no. Five. Five minutes. My bad. Five minutes, right. This guy appears on the scene sometime uh, in 2017, early this year, and claims that he has everything solved, just starts bombarding the message boards with ridiculousness. It just went on and on and on. Then he started traveling around the, the country and met up with a few people. Yeah, you got to give him that. He set himself up with a trip on zero budget where he hit almost every cask site. The kid had dedication. I'll give him that. A fun anecdote to this was all while this was going on, people on Quest for Treasure thought that Josh was literally me and John just trolling people. Like they thought <laughs> we controlled that account and we were just trolling members of Quest for Treasure. So when Josh came to St. Augustine, I made a point. I was like, dude, you're coming to my town. I'm going to take you out. We're going to get a beer. And I did. I hung out with Josh for like seven hours. It was scary as shit. I took a photo with him so we could all finally put to rest. I am not Josh Cornell. And he's a real uh, entity, apparently. He's a real entity, with, and he is super passionate, and he knows exactly what he's doing, and you are all wrong. In fact, I think... Didn't Brian, didn't he send you an email telling you that you were wrong about Cleveland? Yes, the, the way it was solved was incorrect. Well, that's a. <laughs> you didn't get a cask. I'm sorry, Brian. <laughs> yeah, you don't win. Sorry. You didn't get a cask. <laughs> <laughs> you, have, you have to give it back. <laughs> well, I mean, people did that to Rob, too. And let's not leave out Rob Robel, who hooked up with me earlier this year and took me down to Grant Park and showed me, to his best recollection, the spot where he dug up the cask at and told me about all the things that he saw and his interactions with Byron. So uh, that was great to uncover that whole story. We found out that there were actually five guys involved, not just three, to clear up some of that misconception on that. I mean, it just kept getting more interesting. Then we learn a little bit about the book. We talked to friends of your dad, Ben Asen and Joellen Trelling, who worked on the book, one of the podcasts, and found out 
little more about Byron and some of that goings on. I guess the next question is, should we dig in or order Japanese? How did the Japanese hints change everything when they came out about middle of the year? So there's a user on Quest for Treasure named Golden Gate, and he was literally trolling Instagram for Byron price tags. And he comes across this tag that just says Byron Price, and it's just a picture that this girl had taken of the secret published as a manga in Japan. She had no idea what the treasure was. She had no, she had n- no idea about this. She just liked the book. And then we found out there was a Japanese version. And then going through the book, we found out the Japanese version contains hints. And the, inter- the secret internet exploded trying to figure out what these hints are. It took us about a week to get these things translated, and during that week, everybody on Quest for Treasure that had access to the internet, nobody spoke Japanese. We were all trying to figure out <laughs> how to read Japanese. I think Forrest Blight like, enrolled in a Japanese learning course. <laughs> At least three people in this group were trying to... I think Brian was trying to find a guy. Or Brian, don't you know Japanese? Weren't you trying to translate some of it? No, I don't know Japanese. My daughter actually is going to college where she's studying in international relations. So she's on the lookout for someone who can help us. Okay. We were all using Google Glasses and Google Translate and whatever, trying to figure it out. I had the brilliant idea of just going on Reddit and being like, hey, does anybody speak Japanese and want to read this book for me? So I found a dude on Reddit who wanted to read the book. And we did a recording. I don't know, George. I think you got that guy off Fiverr. I did. (laughs) From Africa. He just made everything up. I don't know. Said whatever I wanted him to. (laughs) Brian was trying to get it translated. George had a guy from Reddit translated for him. He recorded that. Didn't someone else try and get it translated? Did Golden Gate get it translated as well? No, he didn't get it translated. There's a guy on Quest for Treasure who does speak Japanese, but he didn't translate it, I guess, because he didn't want to. I don't really know. Everybody was trying to find a translator. Everybody was trying to be like, "Do do we have any friends that speak Japanese? I just went to Reddit. Well, we got the translations through, and everybody listened to them, and I think every single person in our group, it threw some kind of monkey wrench into their theory in some way, which I thought was kind of cool and interesting. The three posts are wooden. You have to start with chicken. Yeah, yeah, start with chicken through people. The three posts are wooden. That screwed everybody up. It said posts are wooden. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Kit, did you ever see these translate these uh, Japanese hints? No, never saw any. But it, it makes total sense that some American or you know English phrases don't really carry over. Well, it was to help with the idioms. I just wonder if we should get that on paper somewhere and get it posted up because I think it's just audio versions that you can get, right? Because you're talking about the actual Japanese book. We have a translation, but nobody's ever transcribed them into text, uh, right? I believe George volunteered to do that. Did I? Yes, you did. Okay. I'll do that. (laughs) I know we're giving out a little, well, someone anonymously is giving out a little present to everybody that's going to include the Japanese translation, so maybe we can get a transcript on it. All right. So thanks, anonymous person who's totally not me. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Is it Josh Cornell? (laughs) Yes. No. It's Josh Gates. He's going to be rich. Right. Well, if all else failed, I was looking for a translator in the court system. We use court interpreters all the time. And it was funny to me that of all the languages, and I mean, it's like the Tower of Babel. We have exotic interpreter day in one court I go to. And there's got to be 50 different translators there at languages I've never even heard of. I couldn't find a single Japanese translator. I guess Japanese individuals don't break the law and have to come to court. It's all I could theorize. But I did find someone after the fact, the Japanese translator is a friend and was more than willing to look at it and translate it. So if you have trouble and you want to send it to me or something, he could probably write it all up. That would, that would be great. I will do that if you're willing. I can talk because to the person. Because we've got like a little Japanese community in St. Augustine that I went to. I physically put the book in some Japanese people's hands and they just looked at it and went, this is really hard. Huh. The way it's written, I don't know much about the Japanese language, but there's like characters for certain words and then there's characters for the way words are pronounced. And they said that it's just written in such a way that it's really hard to translate. 
I can take it to a court interpreter, a Japanese translator, and we can get it under seal, and we can do it that way. <laughs> Brian, didn't your daughter or somebody work in a Japanese restaurant? You even went that route to try to get it done? <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> Take it to the chefs. Did you read this for me? Oh, if, if that is not a Larry David moment, I don't know what is. <laughs> excuse, excuse me, sir. Could you just take a look at this book for me for a second? <laughs> who's yelling at Kit? Who's who's yelling? Shh, there's secrets in that house. What can we hear? <laughs> Speaking of Kit, some idiot podcaster decides 12 casts aren't enough. He puts a 13th one in the ground. So now there's another one. Who would do that? God, what a fucking moron, dude. If, it, if there wasn't <laughs> enough. Let's make it really confusing. Right. And then I guess you commissioned somebody to do the art, right? <laughs> By the way, how's that coming along? Uh, it's, it's, all, it's all done. So. <laughs> Released it yesterday. Uh, yeah. Right. We made a lot of progress. I don't know if you're aware of this, Kit, but before you made this painting, there was another guy. He made paintings for a secret treasure hunt. I don't know if you're aware. Since those paintings have been made, he's been bombarded, and his life has pretty much been ruined by random treasure hunting people bothering him. <laughs> so just in case you weren't aware of what happened to that guy, that's what your future looks like. I cannot <laughs> wait. Well, I don't know. It's easier. It's, you know, people try to contact you or... Oh, we can find ways around the block. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I'd, I'd, I'd probably underestimate he, how easy it is to contact somebody nowadays. It's not going to be uh, difficult for me to uh, just not say anything, you know? It's, it's probably just going to be easy to ignore people. It's probably going to be one of these guys that we're talking to right now that finds it. Wait till somebody shows up at your house in a, in a white panel van and throws you in the back. <laughs> Ties you to a chair with a potato sack over your head, kit. Don't tease him. And you know, you get to a room. They've got voice synthesizers. They go, "Tell <laughs> us everything about this." Right? I mean, we're well, talking Chinese water torture. There are ways. Well, I always, I always told myself, uh, uh, it's better to have a gun and never. Uh, never use it you're missing your script lines. You should be saying. I don't know where he buried it. I just painted the pictures. <laughs> Your dad will tell you what to say. Good. Very smart. <laughs> well, I already burned all the photographs. and uh... <laughs> I can get the heat off of you really quick, Kit. John gave all the answers to Andy. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. In all seriousness, uh, how many people in this group right now actually put a hole in the ground this year we know george has uh matt did right you did six or seven okay brian did you actually get out and put a hole in the ground this year no i did it with uh josh gates last year uh -huh. i put a hole in the ground well sort of <laughs> no bradley put a hole in the ground and roanoke bradley did but kit sort of put a hole in the ground oh I thought that was Bradley. Sorry. Brad put a hole in the ground. Andy, I don't think you put a hole in the ground, did you? No. But you've been looking around New York quite a bit. I did, actually. And to go back to whoever it was, I couldn't tell who brought up the chickens reference. To me, that was one of the greatest moments of the entire year. I was in my house. And Brian either called or texted me. I don't remember. We have been sweating over that New York verse forever. I mean, way back after Cleveland, we spent the day, because we both lived here at the time. We went to Ellis Island, went all over. So we have been going over this. We thought we were going to wind up having it written on our, our tombstone, a uh, hymn of hard word. We just couldn't. It drove us crazy, 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 right? When that whole chicken thing came, everybody's thinking about Kentucky Fried Chicken. Who's the chicken, right? And he texts me, he goes, Ch, dot, 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 Ickens, Charles Dickens. And I mean, I had a surge through my body. The only thing I could relate it to was when we dug into the ground and hit the, hit the box in Cleveland. It was an aha moment that completely rejuvenated every treasure hunting gene in my body i shot to the phone called him up right remember we talked for an hour uh, it was so clear and so obvious and from that moment all these dormant interests in new york sprung back to life to the point where i've gone out now two or three times scoured an area we've all talked about 
because there's so many different still, so many different thoughts. In fact, George, you put me in touch with what's the woman's name who Carlene? sees the images? Yeah, she sees the images, and the uh, she called me to tell me about Brian Park. I, I didn't see what she saw, but her enthusiasm was awesome. But I gone out in different areas in New York particularly with a cousin of mine who was super interested in this 10, 15 years ago. We did it. We, we took the prodding stick. It's like riding a bike. We went out to this little area and he was insistent and we started poking holes. And you guys relate to this so much, right? There's nothing quite as exciting as when you're poking holes and you see these people walking by and you're like, hmm, is he part of the community activist group? Is that an undercover cop? So you stop digging for a second and then you start again. And then somebody with a baby carriage goes by and you look in the carriage. Is that baby an undercover officer? You know, like you, you don't want to get busted, but you don't really. There's an old man sitting reading on the park bench. Is he undercover secret cop? You know, so we stuck the pole on the ground a, a few times. Um, and oh man, the feeling, right? It's like you think it for a second and you hit that the first time you hit something. Oh, and you go, oh, it's got to be a rock. It's going to be a root. But I was coaxed to go out three separate times in the last three months or so just because, really, of that one chicken clue, which I think unlocked a lot of interesting discussion uh, about new areas in New York. So. Yeah, I was listening to that, and I, f I feel like your your story is the exact opposite of me. I'm out <laughs> digging a hole. There's a homeless guy over there. Hey, hey, will you hold my GoPro for me? Because <laughs> you do it at 12 o'clock at night. I do it in the middle of the day like an idiot. <laughs> That's true. That's true. George doesn't dig anything unless it's covered in thorns yeah. lately. I'm all about the <laughs> thorns. <laughs> Somebody pointed out on Facebook, like, in the past couple of months now i've abused myself with thorns cut up my entire body burned my leg broke my foot and now i've cut off my thumb so yay well i think they said something like one more person must die before you can find another cask yeah is that the right it's all because of this hunt all of those injuries you know apart from the burn maybe <laughs> because of this hunt <laughs> and rachel still allows you to do it right yeah she just kind of goes whatever you want to do you have life insurance <laughs> Amazing. Uh, anybody have big plans for the upcoming year as far as uh, trying to uh, dig something up? I've got a full set of 1979 encyclopedias that I plan on diving into. I'm super excited about that. I feel like if we're going to solve this, why don't we solve it the classic way? Ooh, 79. Yeah. Yeah, I think we were looking for, Matt, weren't we trying to find some 1981 encyclopedias? Yeah, and we basically got all the National Geographic's previous to 1981. There's like big articles on St. Augustine, and there's New York, and then there's Chicago, and he must have looked at those at some point. Brian, are you going to make a trip up to St. Augustine and hang out with George? Uh, it's possible, sure. Yeah, you should totally do that. Maybe both of you could actually dig in the Fountain of oh, Youth yeah. where no one else really could. So John Fraser really likes Brian and Andy. He really does. <laughs> so It's because Andy's an international celebrity. You didn't know that. Oh, he's a you're right. <laughs> you guys have no idea just standing around talking to John about the Expedition Unknown episode. You two are all he talked about. He said it was fun hanging out with you and talking to you and interacting with you and, the, you know, your history in the hunt and the joy you had with it. So, yeah, you have no idea how much he enjoyed hanging out with you guys. All right. So here's an idea, George. Uh, we're flying down uh, uh, to uh, Florida tomorrow, my family, for Christmas break. And we're going to be in Delray. I don't even know where that is. That's sort of south. but on Delray Beach? Yeah, on the east side, right? Yep. Brian took me out of the west coast because of all the bad red tide and stuff. So... If Brian wants to drive across the state and pick me up, and then we head north to St. Augustine, I would love to meet you, George, and we can all get together one day and hit the park this week and just have some fun and end with the beer. That would be a great way to spend the day. Look at that. Yeah, that'd be, I'm, I'm, I am all for that. Friends come together on the podcast. How sweet. And Brian's like, my wife has to wash her hair. <laughs> my wife can't make it. There's going to be a lot of births at the hospital that week, and uh, she's got to work. <laughs> oh, anyway. Shortly after that happens, I think I'm going to get with Bradley and Brett, and we're going to formulate a plan to break into the Palancar home. Find that St. Augustine right. painting. Yeah, right. oh. <laughs> George, I'll save you time. I've already got the plans. I'll, I'll send them to you tonight. He's awesome. got the plans. Oh, we just, we just only we had somebody on the inside. You guys have guns, right, Kit? Uh, I, I can't say. <laughs> I sound like I'm my dad now. How can they have guns? Okay. 
Bring bulletproof vests just in case. Guns? What do you mean? Have you seen his dad's artwork? They don't have guns. They have medieval spears, swords, flaming catapults. Oh, cool. I got I got armor. I'm good. <laughs> we'll be all right. I have magic spells. Magic spells, right. We'll bring sewer pipes as defense. Hold on. Let me, let me hold on. Hold on. You hear this? Wait, wait a second. <laughs> that was Kit's airsoft rifle. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Oh, God. Kit's day job is he designs airsoft rifles. <laughs> For some reason, I have a hard time seeing your dad throwing one of his paintings up into Photoshop real quick and then a adjusting it. Like, I just don't see him as a master Photoshopper. He does some pretty cool shit sometimes. If I model for him ever for, a, like, a fantasy painting and he has to, like, distort my face or my body, he's, like, pretty adept at uh, some Photoshop skills. Really? Okay. Put a purple circle <laughs> on the Citadel, you know? Or the Cascade. Well, God, we should have never said anything about him using Photoshop. I just realized <laughs> what's going to happen now. Photoshop was around in 1981. So, Kit, was that actually you as the centaur in the Cleveland picture? No. That was <laughs> uh, his brother. I think I read an article once where your dad said something about digital artists were just moving pixels around. Yeah. And he uses Photoshop. I always thought, like, because I draw sometimes, and I was just like, oh, because I did this thing where I, like, I took all of the all of the paintings that your dad did, and I just sort of reimagined them in my own way. I mean, they didn't have any clues or whatever. Uh, and and then I read that interview, because I did them all digitally, because eh, I got my reasons. Anyway, I did them all digitally, and then I read that article, and I was like, oh, I'm just moving pixels around. Well, I think what he means is, like, strictly digital art, you know, not just, like, little image manipulation, but it, it, there's this illustration book. It's a series called Spectrum, and one comes out every year. I remember when I was a little kid, I'd look through them. Uh, and it was just all traditional art, oil, acrylic, case, and whatever. And then as time went on, uh, the majority of the book turned into digital art. And there are a lot of artists who their digital art is great. And then you'll see them try to do like a pencil drawing or a, a traditional painting. And it's just uh, yeah. it's digital sad. Art. I get what he's saying, man. Digital art doesn't have the heart that traditional art has sometimes it doesn't have the struggle you don't like get yeah. turpentine in your coffee when you're painting you know and then you have cancer in three years that's my whole thing like i'm slightly colorblind so it's super easy for me to adjust uh colors digitally yeah and not so easy when it comes to actual paint hey you're colorblind i didn't know that what do you see in that new york painting can you see a number in there i cannot I'm sorry, I can't see anything. And what is it with your dad and dots, man? <laughs> There's dots everywhere. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Dots and bubbles. Like water droplets. Yeah, water droplets and, and bubbles. Blue glows. Uh, the world may never know. Can't figure out what to put here. I'm just gonna put a bunch of dots. All right. I'll just. I'll ask him on his deathbed. I'm gonna draw this dragon out of dots. <laughs> I have an idea. Tell him to send the solutions to Andy. Okay, I could do that. How come, I keep, how come I keep getting sucked in? Right. You'll, you have to keep all the solutions. You won't, it'll, just, it'll be your torment for the rest of your life. You won't be able to say anything. We're going to extend the attorney-client privilege to the treasure hunter privilege. We'll create our, our own new privilege. I love that. Right. I'm just going to set up a rule in Gmail. Every day, email Andy for <laughs> answers. And wait for me to respond on Facebook. How long will that take? <laughs> They're asking Brian if he'll write to uh, different parks and places for permission to dig. <laughs> yeah, that should be like a side business for you guys. Drafting formal letters. You got a paralegal, right? Okay. Only if you guys do a set of obnoxious commercials like we all see the accident lawyers do all over the country. You solve treasure hunts, we did. A funny story, actually. My grandfather was one of the very first attorneys in Hudson County. He was a pretty big spirit and uh, well-known. But aside from being a lawyer, he also used to be a band leader. <clears throat> he would emcee all the affairs and, and he would march in every parade and he led the band. So years ago, a, a true story, he had a storefront you know, window right in front of uh, the courthouse in Jersey City. And it said, Izzy Michelle, you know, attorney at law. And at one point, he finally had added to the glass front, Izzy Michelle, attorney at law and band leader. And the ethics committee, the ethics committee in New Jersey had a big problem with that. So they came to my grandfather and they said, you cannot advertise yourself as an attorney and a band leader. It doesn't look good professionally. And my grandfather 
took down the attorney at law. <laughs> he left Izzy Michelle, band leader. So there have been moments in the last year or two when they put the words treasure finder under my name. I got a lot of ribbing for that. I thought about taking my business card and just taking off the attorney at law <laughs> and putting treasure finder because it sure sounds a lot sexier. Is that what it said at the bottom, treasure finder? I can't tell you how many people uh, screenshotted that image and sent it to me, Andrew Abrams, treasure finder. And I thought, could it ever get cooler than that? Really? <laughs> treasure finder. You're a winner, Andy. Yeah. So that was a good one. Well, does anybody else have anything from the year in review they wanted to talk about? I'm going to say the most obvious. The success you guys have had with these podcasts. I it's so much fun to interact with you guys. But to bring this to a different medium and to have intelligent conversation and to hear from the different people that I've only read about. And I have driven back and forth in my car listening to this. And the more people that listen and the more that it gets spread on a really personal level, I congratulate you guys for what you did this year. I think it makes it personal, relatable, hearing the stories and the background, listening to Ben talk about you know his time with Byron and, and what they were doing growing up, getting to talk to Kit Palancar about his day. Like, this is such cool, never has been done. And the way it's all come together, you guys had a vision of and then did it. Kudos to you, because I think it's been a great gift to a lot of people. Um, being new to the hunt altogether this year, my wife and I planned a vacation um, after seeing the expedition at Nona to go out and uh, check out Roanoke. A few days before getting there, we were staying at a hotel in Virginia, and I was going through, and I was like, holy shit, there's a podcast. Pulled it up, listened to the first episode. I listened to the second episode, could not wait for the third episode, uh, and I was hooked immediately. And it's kind of cool the way this all started, right? It's just all of us sitting around talking about, like, how we wish we could ask these other people questions. How we wish that all these questions we had, we could answer them if we could just talk to the right people. And how best to do that, right? How best to build a community and get all these other people involved? For me, it was a lot about when I first started, there was so little... You had quests for treasure and a lot of reading, a lot of late nights and reading uh, posts, and some of them were completely irrelevant. So, you know, you had to dig through all these posts, and really, if you wanted more, you had to research on your own, and it was very difficult to find a lot of stuff. And after four years or so of compiling info and seeing what happens when new people come in and there's really nothing for them to latch on to until they do a bunch of reading, and then they finally ask some intelligent questions, they start getting responses. Um, I just thought that having something out there that people could listen to that would give a lot of the backstory and a lot of the current story of what's happened in the last, you know, 15 or 20 years with uh, the Brian finding his cask and the progress that has been made, and then even into some of the people working on the book itself, and just try to get a little bit more information out there in the hopes that somebody will come along and put the right combination of things together and see something differently that we haven't even seen before and make a little breakthrough. So I'm glad that that's happened. And I appreciate you guys listening and especially a lot of you guys for coming on the, the show and taking part in some of the discussions because a lot of this information is firsthand from you. I mean, Brian and Andy, your accounts are kind of priceless to have and Rob's account and especially Matt and all the things that he uncovered and Will House as well down in Houston, his whole story of how he went looking and the parks people down there. I mean, it, it just helps to have this good record of knowledge that people can go back to and, and listen and kind of fill in some of the gaps or the holes that I mean, you can't fill in all of them. We've been trying for 30, 40 years now. It's impossible. But at least you can fill in some of those holes listening to some of the firsthand accounts and the stories. And I think we tried to clear up a lot of the uh, very common uh, misconceptions that were around when we started doing the podcast, right? Didn't we uh, try to take as many of those factoids that ended up being misquotes or not even said at all or just two things put together? We tried to clear up as many things as possible. And George, I think, tried to dig as many spots as possible this year. But yeah, I, I think it's great that we were able to make it and that you all took part in it. And 
I think this last one was a riot. Uh, I don't think I've had as much fun on a podcast since what, since we, we did that first one with Brian and Andy. I, I told my kids tonight, I said I had to get home. I was going to, I had to be on a podcast. Every time I even say it, they look at me and laugh because they, they can't believe I know what a podcast is because I'm so bad with social media. But I would say this, <laughs> uh, and I mean this from the heart. My friend Brian, who's a little quiet over there, gave me a gift 14 years ago, included me in all this, took me out to Cleveland and, and we did what we did. And we joked, we joked on the way home, boy, someday somebody will make a movie. Who's going to play it? Someday somebody will do this. Someday there'll be a podcast, you know, and that gift that he gave me, I'll be 70, 80 years old, retired in Florida. We'll make our way up to St. Augustine and dig, I guess, but it, it is the gift that keeps on giving. And you guys this year, the enthusiasm, the intelligence, the shared information, being part of something so cool. So I thank Roots directly to Brian as the godfather of all of it for me. But I really appreciate being included in such a nice, great group of, of folks who share their ideas and have such enthusiasm for this. This brought me and Andy together closer as friends. Can't beat that. And that's why I gave him a huge chunk of the uh, top of the cask. Please continue talking about how awesome we are. It was a warm message for the holiday. Having you guys said all that, I, I want to say that I think me and John kind of feel the same way. It brought everybody together. It brought, you know, people closer to us. It made a community of people online. Like I've made friends that I wouldn't have made without this podcast. A lot of friends. I've met a lot of people, had a lot of interesting experiences that I wouldn't have had had it not been for this podcast. So all credit to John. Thank you for starting it up. Well, thanks. I myself would like to say thanks to everybody who listens and who follows along and who's absorbed the information, especially because that's what it's there for. And I think there'll probably be some good things to come in the future. But for right now, we want to say have a Merry Christmas and maybe after Christmas when you hear this, but uh, have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year from all of us to all of you. Maybe we can get one of these things out of the ground in 2019, even if it's the one that me and Kit put in. <laughs> yeah, who, who knows? I, I just wanted to say um, thank you too for not only listening to this, um, but uh, keeping the, the hunt alive. And you know, it's been probably 40 years, if not almost 40 years, that this thing is still going on. And it's humbling. And I'm, I'm so grateful to become part of this legacy and to be in a group with such intelligent people who really think of Ox and who, who study and, and spend hours and hours looking at solutions and then cross-referencing maps and, and GPS coordinates and understanding the history. It's, uh, I, sometimes I don't even think it's about finding the treasure. I think it's just about the thrill of the hunt. It's about really figuring it out. And that's the excitement in it is like, it, I feel like the treasure is like Christmas day, you know, not, not trying to make a Christmas joke out of this since it's so close, but just the, the road up to unwrapping your present. That's the excitement. So I wanted to thank all of you for being here and, and continuing to hunt for this. And I'm sure my dad is still surprised as hell that this thing is still going on. I think Byron would have been proud too to see that there's such a dedicated group of people and even a growing group of people that are still interested in something that he made you know, 40 years ago with his friends, which in itself was a really cool idea. Thank all of you, and thanks for being here, and we will see you again in, uh, I guess, in 2019. Tune in next time for another edition of Shh, The Secret Podcast with your hosts, JM and Bernstein. Available on iTunes.